This podcast is brought to you by WRFL, Radio Free Lexington. Find us online at wrfl.fm. Catch us on your FM radio while you're in Central Kentucky at 88.1 FM, all the way to the left. Thank you for listening, and please be sure to subscribe. Welcome to From the Woods, Kentucky. I'm Laura Lotka, and I'm here with my co-host, Renee Williams. And today in studio, we have James Wright with the Kentucky Division of Forestry. And James is the Director and State Forester for the Kentucky Division of Forestry. It's a pleasure to have you in studio today. Thank you for having me. So today we're going to talk about the Kentucky Division of Forestry, but before we get started, um, tell us a little bit about how you became interested in forestry. Well, growing up, I was an avid outdoorsman, so I like to hunt, fish, and do a lot of those things. Believe it or not, when I was going through school and I started at the University of Kentucky, I started out in accounting. But as I did so, I realized that's not really what I wanted to do. So I did a lot of research here on campus and, and actually knew someone that was in at that time and, and was getting ready to graduate. So I came over and talked to Dr. Range, who's still here, and, and I was sold. So uh, after my first year, I, I transferred to this particular department here and uh, got my forestry degree three years later so I was very excited to find it and uh, haven't regretted it since. Great. It's a big switch from accounting. <laughs> oh, I, see, I think I may be the first accountant slash forester out there. I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us a little bit about what you do um, at the Kentucky Division of Forestry. Well currently as you said I'm the uh, director and state forester. However with my career when I did the graduate from the University of Kentucky I started out as a field forester in southeast Kentucky and then transferred into central Kentucky doing a lot of stewardship type work with landowners and timber management, timber stand improvement, tree planting. Um, eventually became a supervisor in various fashions up until I become director three years ago. Today I'm in charge of obviously all of our policies that we have statewide. We have 129 employees. Uh, we have an approximately a 18 to 20 million dollar budget we deal with every year so i've got all the budgetary requirements on that and then also aside, aside from day-to-day operations with our uh, our landowner services and our fire suppression services I also work on behalf of the national association of state foresters and the southern group of state foresters on regional and national policies Okay. One thing I have learned about our forestry careers is that we have a lot of acronyms. <laughs> and so for the Kentucky Division of Forestry, we call that KDF. So tell us a little bit about what KDF is. So the Division of Forestry, we're comprised of six branches. We have six field branch offices located throughout the Commonwealth. We have two branch offices in our main office. We have a forest protection branch and a forest management branch. Mm-hmm. Um, our protection branch houses forest health. Which, you know, We provide a lot of forest health uh, services to the state. Um, we also have the uh, fire section, which is obviously our wildfire suppression. The main crux of what we do in the department, though, is we actually work for landowners. So Kentucky, as you all well know here, are, are mostly privately owned. We have approximately 12.4 million acres of forest land, and that's 88% privately owned. So the division's main objective when it comes to forest management is to work with landowners. So we have a lot of landowner-related services, be it timber management, tree planting, but we also do the wildfire suppression. So wildfire suppression is border-to-border statewide. So really, our goal is to manage our resources and protect our resources, but to get that done in the state of Kentucky, it has to be done on private land more than not. Is there a certain amount of acres that you will do management practices on? Well, we don't have a limited amount of acres. We'll visit anyone to be qualified for several different programs, such as this forest stewardship program. You have to have a minimum of 10 acres of forest land. But we will work with any landowner because there are tree planting opportunities or even small woodlots. You know, for example, when you get into Fayette County here, most of these folks have small woodlots. We do a lot of small woodlot management because you have to look at that particular canopy as, a, as an entire ecosystem, and everyone's got a little part in that, so we, we don't want to turn away those customers. But to, to get cost share money and things of that nature that we'll, we'll discuss, I'm sure, today, you have to have a minimum of 10 acres of forest land. And can you tell a little bit about the um, forest stewardship program, what that involves? So the forest stewardship program is really geared towards our private landowners. And if you, for example, if you've got 100 acres of land in Harrison County or Perry County or anywhere around the, around the state, you want to have someone take a look at it. You can go online, submit an application to your local office down there. And what we do is we'll send a forester out. They'll meet with, give you a call, schedule an appointment, and we'll walk through your property, figuring out what your objectives are. Are you interested in timber management? Are you interested in uh, recreation, aesthetics, water quality? 
for us, that, that's how we'll direct our plan and what we're going to do on your property. But ultimately, we're going to do an inventory of your property so you'll know exactly what your species composition is and your age classes and things of that nature. And then we'll make recommendations for you on whether or not you need to do some thinnings, uh, let it grow. There may be you need a timber harvest. In addition to that, that particular program can help you qualify for federal cost share dollars to actually implement the project. So if you did need, for example, 10 acres of timber stand improvement done, we as an agency would come in and mark that for you, and then you as a landowner could qualify for federal money to go in and have a vendor come in and cut it so that we get the project done on the ground. So that's that's the crux of what we do with our stewardship program. You mentioned forest health earlier. We've talked about several different bugs and invasive plants and things like that. What do your foresters do for people on a forest health? Well, a lot, a lot of the calls that we get are sick tree requests is mm-hmm. what we get. So, we'll, Or someone sees a patch of oaks, for example, that's, that's the crown's turning on it. So we'll go out and we'll investigate on the ground initially if we think there's a health issue. Some of our foresters are, are a little bit more well-versed in forest health than others, myself included, you know. Mm-hmm. So we hire specialists. So so <laughs> at that point, if we think there's an issue, we'll send some of our, our forest health specialists. We have in my office down there, and they will look to see if they can identify the actual pest working in conjunction with UK and, and a lot of their uh, research laboratories here. Hopefully we can identify what the pest is. And, and then, of course, then we'll get back in touch with the landowner and we'll, for the method of treatment. Mm-hmm. And here recently, obviously, the NRA We've had that over the last several years that's been coming through. Uh, it's We've got now some various other things that we're looking at around the state, but Hemlock, Willie, Adelgid, we're, we're, we're in the treatment process with that. So our, our health program is very robust right now as far as the, the need. Uh, we're working on the the actual uh, staffing side of that as we speak. But anybody that has any issues, feel free to call us, call your local office once again, and we'll do everything we can to help you identify what's going on and provide some kind of recommended treatment. So are there different recommendations for every kind of different bug or invasive species? It, it really depends on what you're dealing with. First of all, how widespread is it? But yes, there are certain treatments for each individual pest or insect of that nature. And you also mentioned um, tree planting. And I was just curious if you could talk a little bit about the um, state nurseries and some of the tree seed. Program that yeah, you have. We have two nurseries. We have one that's located in East Kentucky and one's located in West Kentucky. The primary goal of those particular uh, is reforestation, those particular nurseries, reforestation. We are really and truly do hardwood silviculture in the state, so we try to raise hardwood seedlings. We have a small complement of pines, but nothing like we used to have in the past. So we concentrate on high quality hardwoods. Well, I think we grow in the neighborhood of 1.5 to 2 million seedlings a year. Mm-hmm. So we, you know, we're trying to get as many as we can on the ground. The the nursery in West Kentucky is is the largest of the nursery. Mm-hmm. It's about 90 acres, and I believe the one in East Kentucky is around 30 acres. Right now, if you go online right now, we do have our sales that are open right now. Uh, you can order, uh, you can download an order form, and order will start delivering in January through April. Now we are currently, as we speak, developing an online sales database right now. So hopefully. Hopefully, by the spring, we'll have some online sales where you can be, it'll be a little bit more convenient for you to, uh, to order seedlings. Mm-hmm. Okay, great. Is there a specific time of year you need to plant these trees? I personally prefer the spring plantings. So anything, you know, I, I would shoot for late February into March and April, uh, just from a civil cultural standpoint. And the great thing about this is we can have them shipped right, you know, if you have a very large order, you have the, uh, the opportunity to come pick it up the nursery. But if not, we'll have them shipped right to your front door. Mm-hmm. That's great. That's nice. Is there a minimum amount? That you I believe 10. 10. Yeah. Okay. Don't quote me on that one, but right. I believe it's 10. So even if you had a small yes. small woodland, you could you could get some, exactly. a small amount. And, we, and we actually, you know, many years ago, we went to some of the smaller because we wanted landowners that just that sort of they didn't want 100 or 200 or 1,000. Mm-hmm. You know, a lot of them may want 10 or 20 plums or things of that nature. So we did start selling the smaller packages for some of our smaller landowners. And they're also very popular in the urban setting, too, for folks that want to put some, some yard trees out and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about the urban and community forestry program? So, yeah, we have a very strong urban program. Uh, Bridget Abernathy is running our program right now. Another UK grad, very glad to have her on board. We we work quite a bit in some of our larger metropolitan areas, Lexington, Louisville, and uh, northern Kentucky, but she also is very active in some of the smaller communities that want to start an urban tree board or, or something of that nature. We the Tree City USA, obviously, is a pretty strong uh, program that she pushes. But she's constantly working with the, these folks on the reforest bluegrass type projects that you all have here in, in Lexington. Uh, we have a reforest northern Kentucky, a reforest Frankfurt. So those community projects are taking off now in the spring. And uh, you know your urban your urban forest is extremely important to you, whether you realize it or not, both from a mental and physical health standpoint. So we we like to put as much time and effort into that as we can. And Bridge has done an outstanding job with the with the boards statewide to uh, promote that program. So does every county have a forester that they can call if they need help? Yes, we have a forester assigned to every county, but 
Foresters will have multiple counties. So, for example, we have a Frankfurt branch office here, and that particular branch has 30 counties with four Foresters assigned to it. So, you know, it may you may have to wait a few days or a few weeks, but we typically we will have one person assigned to every county that, you know, if we can get someone else to come out and talk to you, we, we will. We don't have individual county foresters. So if you do have a little bit of a wait, we apologize, but we're doing the best we can to get there as quickly as we can. Yeah. So how do you find out who your local forester is? The best thing to do is go to visit our website. When you get on our website, you'll have a, you can, you have a map that'll come up uh, on your website that you can look at and you'll have a contact number for that particular, find out where your county's at. That number will be your contact if you want to order tree seedlings, if you want to do a stewardship plan, if you have happen to have a wildfire, be the best number to call right off the bat. So, so whatever county you fall in, whatever branch you fall in around the state, that'll be your best number to, for any of the services we provide uh, from the division. Can you talk a little bit about the, the state forest that y'all manage? So we have approximately 48 to 49,000 state forest lands in Kentucky. You know, we have around nine or 10 different properties. We practice active management on our properties. We want to pr- do the same things that we're asking our landowners to do. You know, we're trying to, we try to put in civil cultural demonstrations, be it timber harvesting, timber stand improvement, or reforestation practices. So we do all that on, on our uh, properties. They are located from east to west. If you get on our state website, we'll have a state forest section that'll have a map and show you where all of them are at. They are open to uh, for hiking and, and various ones are open to hunting. You need to look at the local restrictions because some we do manage some of those in conjunction with the Department of Fish and Wildlife. So some of them are managed hunts. But, um, you know, the, lar- the, the largest complement of the land is going to be in southeast Kentucky on the Kentucky Ridge State Forest. And then when you get over in west Kentucky, we have the Pennyrail State Forest. Okay. So we have uh, two big chunks. The remainder are relatively small when you look at, you know, they may be anywhere from 700 to 1,500 acres. You had mentioned some practices. Can you mention and explain some of those practices that a woodland owner might hear about or that you might have done on the state forest? Yeah, so timber stand improvement is the most common practice we'll do with a landowner. We'll come into your property. We'll take a look at what you got. I tell people it's like weeding a garden. You know, we're going in and we're cutting out some of the junk so everything else can grow better. Mm -hmm. So if we're coming into a stand and we're having some species composition issues, we're, we're, we're trying to promote oak a little bit more, which means we need a little bit more sun like to the forest floor or, or on the, you know we need to do some crop tree release and it's pretty easy we'll come in and put blue paint on it and, and if it's got blue paint cut it if it doesn't leave it alone so uh, those are the type of projects I talk to landowners about if you do have a harvest we'll come in and uh, we, we mark a harvest for you we'll give you the total volume of what we've got broken down by each individual tree and each individual species so as a landowner you can now take this and you, you can uh, try to sell your your timber on your own if you want to go through a consultant forester you can have that information to get to a consultant forester but we provide you with that packet so that you know what you're selling, how much you're selling, and whoever's going to buy it will know exactly what they're buying. The other things that we do, we'll recommend tree planting. And so if you do have some uh, abandoned farmland or some abandoned agricultural fields you want to put back in the tree planting, we'll help you determine the spacing, number of trees per acre, the species that, that will grow best on that particular soil. Obviously, we have the seedlings for sale as we discussed. But in addition, we do have some equipment, some tree planting bars or a tree, the uh, tree planting machine you can use with a tractor that will loan out to landowners free of charge, so they can uh, you know help you know reforest certain areas of the property. I believe they've got a thousand tree minimum on that because it takes a while to come out and set it up. You spend more time setting it up than you would. You could probably hand plant your thousand trees a little bit quicker. But, <laughs> but uh, so we had, those are the those are the main types of, of activities and projects that we do for landowners or help them with. Can you describe the difference between a consulting forester and a KDF forester? Yeah, so a KDF forester, obviously they work for the state of Kentucky and we'll come out and we typically do everything that we, we provide free of charge. Uh, the only thing we charge for is timber marking. The consulting forester, they'll come out and they're working on the behalf of the landowner. Mm-hmm. So if you want to hire a consulting forester, for example, to do a timber harvest for yourself to, to mark a harvest, they usually, not all of them, but usually they'll work on a percentage very similar to uh, to selling a house, you know, an agent selling a house. They'll work on a percentage of your sale. So if you, you know, whatever you sell your timber for, you all have an agreed contract. But the great thing for the landowner on that is they're, they basically sign the contract and the consultant forester will handle everything from start to finish. So the landowner has no, really no true involvement in the selling part. If we're going to mark timber for you, we will give you the packet, but it's up to you and the landowner to sell the timber. Mm-hmm. So the, the benefit of the consulting forester is they, they're paid for the services, but they also handle everything from start to finish. Mm-hmm. And they know what the timber prices are. They follow the, they follow the market very close because that, obviously that's what they do for a living. Mm-hmm. Uh, they'll have a lot of contacts on, on to sell timber too. So we highly recommend for folks around the state to, to, to utilize consulting forces as much as they can. Because I tell anyone, when I talk to landowners, about their timber, it's it's no different than me and a piece of antique furniture. If I've got an antique desk, I don't have any clue if it's worth five thousand or fifty thousand dollars. So if I sell it on my own, that's the risk I take. 
Timber's the same way. A lot of landowners don't understand the value of what they've got. So if you have a consulting forester, they can help determine that true value. That's what they uh, work for. And, um, you know, they're going to sell your timber for the most that they can. And then basically you pay for their services to the contract. You do a lot of educational programs in Kentucky Division of Forestry. Can you tell us a few of those? Yeah, so we uh, we do education from the smallest to the landowner. So a lot of a lot of what we do in each of the branches, we'll have a lot of uh, school education programs. Uh, Smoky Bear is very popular for uh, for the younger age kids. Uh, so a lot of our elementary schools will contact us, and we'll we'll be glad to do Smoky Bear programs. When you get up into the high school age kids, we do a lot of career day type talks um, because we obviously want to drum up interest for our profession and for young adults to come into our profession. So it's extremely important for us to get out to these schools as much as we can mm-hmm. to talk to both, like I said, the young ones and the and the older ones. We do a lot in the springtime when it gets when, when everybody's kind of wanting to get out and, and get out and about in the springtime. So a lot of uh, outdoor classroom type stuff in the springtime, especially near Arbor Day, uh, a lot of tree planting events. We're very, you know, very happy to do as many of those as we can. And then when you go to the other side, uh, we also do a lot of landowner programs. Because the whole idea is, once again, we're so much privately owned in the state of Kentucky that we need to get the word out to our landowners on the services that we have to offer and what is proper forest management. Why do we want to do it? How do we do it? So a lot of the classes we have like that are tailored towards landowners to where we can show them practices that we have done. Here's the results of things that we've done. And here, and then, of course, again, here's how you get our services. So we'll do several of those a year also all throughout the, uh, the Commonwealth. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. This is the time when normally you'd be listening to Wildlife Sounds of the Forest with Dr. Matt Springer. But this week, we're giving Matt a break, and myself, Jonathan Larson, and Hannah Hallwell will be coming to you with insect sounds from the forest. There are lots of different animals out there, and yes, they make interesting sounds, but did you know there are over one million different insect species in the world? And that's only the species that we know about. So for these episodes, you'll be learning a little bit about the amazing insect diversity around us. What are those insects that make those weird sounds? What are they doing and how do they make those noises? We're going to listen to the sound of one insect today. See if you can guess what it is. Stay tuned for the end of the show when we'll talk more about this insect, what it is, and why it's making this noise. Welcome back to From the Woods, Kentucky. Let's get back to our interview. And so where can people find information on the forest landowner programs or, um, you know, if they have an interest in getting someone to come out to their school, how can they... Find Once again, I would I, I recommend it, you know, if you've got any teachers out there listening to go to our website okay. and and when you find the map of our state, if your school is located within that branch, that branch office is the best place for you to uh, to find any of these services that we have to mm-hmm. offer because the foresters and the rangers that are doing the work on the ground are the same ones that will be coming to your school to, to talk to your children or to talk to the landowners mm-hmm. also. So they're all, once again, they wear a lot of hats, mm-hmm. uh, but, but our employees typically enjoy that because they're doing a lot of different things. So... Uh, you know, obviously, I would I would encourage everyone to, to get on UK's extension website because we have a lot of landowner. We do a lot of cooperative efforts with the uh, with the University of Kentucky here for landowner education programs and field days. So they'll, they'll have a lot of information on there too of where we'll be and, and the type of things we'll be talking about. Okay, great. So you also run the Kentucky Master Logger Program, correct? In cooperation with us, I guess you could say. So mm-hmm. can you tell us a little bit about it? So the Master Logger Program is part of our Kentucky Forest Conservation Act. You know, we, we're coming up on 20 years with that. Uh, it is housed here at the university, uh, even though our agency is the one that, that runs it. But basically, when you're logging in the state of Kentucky, you have to be a certified master logger. So if we come out to inspect the logging job, the first thing we're looking for on site is whether or not we have a master logger on site, which is one of the primary laws that we have out there. Now, that particular class up here is a three-day course that goes on throughout. You know, Once again, you can get on the master logger website. And it's a three-day course that goes on throughout the state at various uh, times throughout the year. Once you get your, your certificate, then you have so many continuation hours that you have to get over the next several years to keep that certification up. So it's an extremely good program on our behalf. Obviously, you get a lot of things from BMP implementation to safety and things like that you're going to need on the job site. It is a state law. 
to make sure you have one, you know, to have one on site. We've had it for 20 years. We feel very, we feel like it's a very successful program, and we're excited to be a part of it, you know, moving forward. Mm-hmm. You mentioned BMPs. Explain that a little bit. Yeah, so BMP, so it's, it's considered best management practice. So when we're going out to look at logging jobs, the Kentucky Forest Conservation Act is a water quality law, not a timber law. It's a water quality law. We're just enforcing it within the woodland area. But primarily, we're going to look for water bars, things that are going to divert water off of the roads and into the, uh, you know, into, into the leaf litter and things to help, you know, the sedimentation settle out. We'll look for any kind of broad-based dips. Um, we may, if you've got, you had to cross a stream, you have to make sure you get the mud out of the streams. You may have to uh, reseed and straw some of the ingress and ingress into these uh, streams. But we're we're coming out there to look and ensure that your best management practices have been implemented to the extent of the law before we we'll allow you to retire that site and move off site with your equipment. So now, is that just the master logger that you're looking at, or are you looking at what the woodland owner allowed the master logger to do? It primarily work? falls on the logger. The law it's the logger's responsibility to uh, implement those laws. If there are certain situations where the landowner does not want certain things put in that they will take control of the site and so we work with the landowner and, and you still have to enforce the same law that we expect the logger to, to enforce so uh, typically the loggers are the ones that are tasked with, with those remedial measures it's been a very successful program most of our loggers out there are more than happy to put the, put it back better than they found it as far as from a compliance standpoint we're excited about what the loggers are doing we're excited about the results that we're seeing from the law and uh, we don't see any major issues with it moving forward. Okay. So how can woodland owners, if they need a logger, how can they find one? Most of our uh, offices will have a list of loggers, but if you go to the Kentucky Forest Industry Association, they're a great contact. Get on their website. You can talk to them. They, you know, they'll have a list of loggers around the state. Our offices typically have a list of unofficial lists that they try to keep up, at least for the folks that are in business regionally mm-hmm. in their areas, so that if a landowner is, is looking for someone, they can at least give them a list of names. Uh, and, and selling your timbers like anything, you want the more bidders you have, the better price you're going to get. So we, it's like selling a house. We we recommend contacting as many as you can, and that'll help determine your fair price as you uh, put it on the market. Now, one thing you mentioned uh, just brief, kind of at the beginning, is that y'all work on wildland fire management. Can you talk a little bit about that program? And- so we part of our responsibilities is we have all wildfires within the state. So mm-hmm. we we have a pretty big program here in Kentucky. Anytime there's any kind of wildfire. Uh, outside of the Daniel Boone, we typically we're typically the ones that go there. We have multiple dozers. We probably have 50 dozers that are stationed throughout the state for emergency response. We have several engines that we have uh, stationed throughout the state also. So if you do have a wildfire or you see a wildfire and you call us, we'll dispatch someone within the vicinity. Uh, they'll have a crew with them. We'll typically you'll see us on the on the hills where you've got backpack blowers and chainsaws and bulldozers and everything. But ultimately, the whole goal is to minimize the effect on the resource because you know I believe. $404 per acre or something that the university here did a study on of, of timber loss on an area that's been burned. So our, our goal is to protect this resource as much as possible. We also do a lot of fire assistance outside of the state of Kentucky now. We are, we're, we're very active in that. Typically, most of your agencies nowadays are utilizing other agency services because we have smaller governments, fewer employees, less resources. So you need to call for help a little bit more. So we've been, this year alone, we've been in Alaska, Florida, South Carolina, North Carolina. And what will happen there is they'll need assistance and we'll send our folks out to help them. And in return, if we have another bad season here in Kentucky, they will, in return, we can ask for assistance back from them. So we we do quite a bit of -of out-of-state fire assistance also. So do different states have a different fire season time? Yes, it, and if you look, uh, you know, you look at a national map, it'll move. You know, you've got the uh, hardwood areas of, uh, of Kentucky and Tennessee and, and, and West Virginia, places like that. You're looking in the spring and fall. Typically, it's when your humidity levels are at the lowest, but your temperatures are at a point where they're heating up the forest floor. And before you get canopy cover, out west, you're pretty much looking at the summer. It's, although, I say that, but they burn now pretty much in August, it seems like. Mm-hmm. And in the south, the very far south, you're typically looking at, at your summer fire. So... What will happen for us in the traditional years, we'll, we'll be very busy at home in February and March and, and April, and then we'll start getting the calls for California and Nevada and Utah, places like that. That'll start up typically in about May, and we'll offer any assistance that we can uh, out west during that time, and then we'll go right back in our fire season again in October and November in, in the fall. So we a little bit of reprieve over the holidays uh, to get our equipment back in, to get some rest, get our equipment back in shape, to gear up for another run. And as you all see on TV nowadays, it's a... Uh, it is an issue, and it's going to continue to be an issue, these wildfires that we're going to have to deal with. So all agencies are on board with helping one another to ensure to mitigate the problems as much as we can. So if somebody accidentally starts a wildfire, mm-hmm. um, do they end up having to pay the division to put that out? or how's If you that? have calls to fire and we come in and we, we suppress the fire, we will charge you with suppression costs, you know, mm-hmm. based on what it costs for our folks to come out today and suppress the fire. A lot of arson, we have a lot of arson in the state of Kentucky, so, you know, obviously if we can't determine 
what the cause is, then when it is an arson fire, we'll investigate that. We have a Fish and Wildlife officers helping us, so they provide the law enforcement. So if we do think that we have an arson issue in a certain area, they will start investigating that and following up on that. And we have a lot of this in the springtime. We have a lot of landowners that are eager to get out and, and burn brush and things like that. They don't realize how dry it is and, and what the humidity levels are, but that is when we see most of our, our escape fires that the landowners themselves actually have to pay for. So. We obviously urge everyone to take those precautions. Once again, go to our website, read up on your state fire seasons in the spring and the fall. You know, we have a law that you cannot burn within 150 feet of the woods between 6 a.m. and 6 p.m. That's for a reason, because that's when your humidity levels are low and it's easy for the fire to escape. So read up on your laws, but understanding no matter if you're within the window or outside the window, if you do let the fire escape, you could be charged with suppression costs on that particular incident. So you've mentioned a little bit about kind of the shrinking government and some shrinking personnel. Can you talk a little bit about what kind of what you do in your agency to overcome that? Yeah, so nowadays, you know, we, we kind of think outside the box nowadays when we're trying to figure out how we can force multiply. Because obviously, you know, we're not gonna we're not gonna get more money or more or more folks to our agency. So we have a lot of collaborative efforts now we've started uh, doing with, with multiple state agencies and NGOs. Uh, in federal agencies, uh, the Daniel Boone National Forest, we, we work very well with those folks. We've signed a master cooperative agreement with them in which the, we assist them on fire suppression activities and they assist us on fire suppression activities within the first 24 hours. If we've got uh, resources closer, we can go ahead and take care of the problem or at least get started until they get their folks there and vice versa. So what this does, it helps us build up the, our capacity area in and around the National Forest. And then bigger picture wise, we're also looking at doing a lot of shared stewardship type work with them in the future in increasing that uh, cooperative effort to where now we may come in and start doing timber sales with them, marking timber and, and, and sharing some of our resources. Uh, that gives them the opportunity to manage their state for or their federal land um, more than they've had in the past and to use local resources to do it. And of course, the for us, it's good for us because you know we can we can help our budget line, but we also ultimately we're having an effect on the resource. And the, and the one thing that I tell my folks when we're out there is regardless of where we're at and what we're doing, who we're working with, our goal is to have an effect on the resource in the state. Mm -hmm. So if we're, if, whether it's a federal footprint or a state footprint or a private landowner footprint, we, we need to affect that resource. So we, we've been doing that quite a bit more. We've got some efforts with the uh, Fish and Wildlife. You know, we help them on some of their properties and they help us vice versa with some, some of their particular uh, special interest areas. Uh, we work very well now with the nature preserves. They're housed in the same building that I am in Frankfurt. So they have a lot of special projects, but they have some, uh, a shortage of, of, of uh, manpower also so we'll come in and we'll provide equipment and some workers to come in and do some work on their property we have some cooperative efforts with the nature conservancy uh, helping them with some prescribed fire activities around the state so we've done a lot of work like that with them here in the last several years and in, here recently we've just uh, signed a, an agreement with the u.s fish and wildlife service out in the western part of the state to help do some burning on some grasslands out there so as you can tell we do we have a lot of things going on that are different than what we've done in the past and, or maybe not different but a lot more than we've seen in the past and so uh so we do work a lot with these other races and we're, we're going to continue to try to leverage those partnerships because ultimately uh we're all in it for the same reason and and we need to collaborate a lot more than we have in the past in order to get our objectives accomplished on the ground yeah well with us as well uk forestry other than the master logger program we have programs like the woodland or short course yes. that we work with you as well so we work hand in hand a lot and, and, and yes and that's a perfect example because you know and i've, I've talked to, to a lot of people about our, our education side of things and we we leverage your all's extension programs to help us because we cannot reach the masses like we need to so we're you know we have a really good effort and, and collaboration with you all on all of our extensions so it's just it's one big family that we have to do to you know in order to to reach the forestry sector like we're trying to reach well you've presented us with a lot of great information and what would be one or two takeaway items that you'd like to leave our listeners with well the main thing is really we're just trying to promote forestry in the state of kentucky and it's mm -hmm. it's when you look at the impact, the economic impact is thirteen and a half billion dollars, but we're also twelve point four million acres. You know, it's a, it's forty eight to fifty percent of our land mass. So, a lot of folks, myself included, is when I grew up. You know, I grew up in a very urban area, may not have understood the importance of a forest lands and what they do. Whether you like to hunt, hike, fish, or whatever, is to uh, if you've got property, look at what you've got, take an interest in what you've got, reach out to someone for help, be it you know, our state agency or a consultant forester and just have someone get on the ground with you and, and give you some ideas of what you can do to make your forest land better. Because ultimately it does matter. It's all part of a, part of a larger ecosystem. Uh, we're very, very lucky in the state that we live in and, and the natural resources that we've got. So if anything, hopefully this will pique someone's interest that may not have had it in the past and they can call and maybe not even realize the kind of help that's out there for them. So uh, we, we hope to hear from a lot of folks and we, uh, we look forward to getting on the ground with a lot of them. 
Great, great. Well, thank you, James, for joining us today. And if you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Stay tuned for Insect Sounds from the Forest. You've been listening to From the Woods, Kentucky with co-hosts Renee and Laura. We'll be right back after this short break. Welcome back to Insect Sounds from the Forest. I'm Dr. Ellen Crocker in the Department of Forestry and Natural Resources at the University of Kentucky. Before we tell you what that is, let's listen to that sound once more. I think most people know what that sound is. Yeah, so that's a that's a bumblebee. Okay, so there's different types of bees, obviously. Do all of them make different sounds, or is it pretty much all buzzing? Well, it's all buzzing of one sort or another, <laughs> but there's a lot of different types of buzzing, and buzzing for different reasons. Uh, so bumblebees, you know, they're, they're always going to kind of make this buzzing sound when they fly, but um, they also use that buzz as uh, part of their strategy uh, to get pollen and to pollinate plants, right? When they land on the plant, that buzz is the right frequency to kind of stimulate the plant and it shakes the pollen loose and it gets on their hairy bodies so they can transport it around <laughs> to help make sexual reproduction for the plant. Well, that's interesting. We have a lot of, I think it's tomato growers in greenhouses that they will buy colonies of bumblebees and let them loose in the greenhouse so that they can pollinate their tomato plants. Hmm. They just keep them within the greenhouse? Yeah, I mean, a, bu a bumblebee, they can get aggressive if you poke their house, but generally speaking, they're pretty big, docile things. Once they're on the flower, they just want to get their food. Yeah. Have you ever been stung by a bumblebee? Mm, unfortunately, no. No? Yeah. Now explain what a bumblebee looks like, the difference between that and another bee. Imagine if I was a bee. Okay. <laughs> I'm a big, tall dude with lots of hair on my face. They're like large, clumsy looking insects that are very hairy. But they are kind of the gentle, gentle yes, bee giants. Yes, gentle giants of the yeah, world. Yeah, and then they, some of them are in groups, but some are also solitary, is that right? So. Bumblebees are social. They have a queen and they have workers and they even have drones in the colony. Uh, some of them are cuckoo bees, so they come in and they steal from each other's hives, just like a <laughs> cuckoo bird would. But, uh, yeah, they are social, just like the honeybees are. Their colonies are much smaller than honeybees would be, and they're less aggressive overall. They're also different because they can sting multiple times. So a bee has a barbed stinger, a honeybee does. A bumblebee has a straight line stinger. They can sting you until they run out of venom. Oh, so I think most of what people think of when they think of bees are the honeybees, mm -hmm. but actually a really tiny percentage of bees worldwide make honey at all, and the ones that we humans use for honey are just a handful of different species. And here in the U.S., it's the European honeybee, um, and they're not native to here, so we have lots of native bees uh, that you might not see as many or be a, as as uh, aware of um, that are that are here. They're pollinating plants. Um, doing all sorts of exciting things, leading, leading exciting bee lives. We have about 3,000, 5,000 species of, uh, of native pollinating bees that live here just in the United States. It includes the mason bees, the leafcutter bees, the mining bees, the bumblebees, uh, squash bees, all different kinds. And sometimes not only are they pollinating, they're better pollinators than the European honeybee that we've introduced. Like if you want good pumpkins, you want squash bees mm -hmm. to pollinate your plants because they're a better pollinator for that plant. They've adapted and evolved with each other over a long period of time, whereas the honeybee can actually rob the nectar from the plant without getting any pollen on it. So they sneak in, drink all the sugar juice, and leave without actually pollinating the crop. Hmm. So now are all bees black and yellow? No. Uh, some bees are black and white. Some bees have orange stripes on them. If you look at some of the sweat bees specifically, they come in lots of different metallic colors. They can be green, they can be blue, they can even be kind of purple. Mm -hmm. So they all kind of exhibit that aposematism, that warning coloration that says, hey, if you <laughs> mess with me, I will sting you. It's supposed to be a bit of an advertisement that you shouldn't mess with them. Mm -hmm. But no, it's not always the same color. So now these bees, you said, could sting over and over again. So like they could sting you and then 
live for a while and then go sting someone else. Is that how it works? <laughs> yeah. Uh, so bumblebees, they don't have that barb on their stinger. When a honeybee stings, it gets stuck in mammalian skin. Mm -hmm. And as they fly away, it actually pulls out most of their internal digestive system and organs. Oh. And it leaves the venom sac behind so it can continue to pump venom into your body. That's why you're supposed to scrape off the sting when you get stung by a, a honeybee. But with bumblebees, with some of the other bees I mentioned, with yellow jackets or other wasps even, mm -hmm. their stinger is straight. And when it goes into your skin, they can withdraw it and then go to another spot and say, yeah, here looks good and sting you there too. Mm. I have personal experience with this. I worked with bumblebees as a grad student and I got them in my pants once and didn't know oh, it. No. And then they stung me up and down my legs. And yeah, I had three or four bees in my pants, but I had about 12 or 16 sting sites on oh. my legs. Yeah. Must not have been a good feeling. It was not a great day. Yeah. It was not a great day. Now, does it swell up as much as honeybees though? Because it doesn't have that venom. It does pack associated with it. It's not the same venom, yeah, and you're getting less, but over and over again. <laughs> uh, and everybody reacts differently. Have you ever been stung by anything? I have been stung by yeah. like, uh, just a paper wasp or something. Okay, what happened to you? Um, I really didn't have a reaction. My brother, though, on the other hand, got stung on his nose, I remember, as a child, and his whole face swelled up, and it was the funniest thing to me, because <laughs> I was, we were five or something, but he definitely has a higher reaction to those than I do. I think your brother and I are in the same camp. I tend to react more to insect saliva and venom, and so I get big <laughs> knots under my skin, yeah. and it hurts, and I have to put ice packs on them for days. Oh, no. Well, that does not sound fun. How about you? <laughs> Do you have any problems with oh, insects? Oh, you know, I try not to. <laughs> <laughs> they're, they're good side. This is why you like trees, right? Exactly. They tend to be exactly. nicer. <laughs> well, not all of them. Sometimes not all of them. They can, they can be pretty bad, too. Um, so, you mentioned that, uh, you know, some of these bees are solitary and they live by themselves. Um, I feel like we tend to think of bees being in a hive, but um, is that true for, for all bees? What are a lot of our native bees? Where do they live? I mean, it depends a lot on what type of bee, but some of the, like the carpenter bees or, or whatever will burrow into, into wood. Um, I think they live primarily solitary. They don't, they don't really form hives. The mining bees, they're solitary. It's just an individual female that mates, and then she digs her hole down into the soil and provisions it for her young. But she doesn't have sisters that she's hanging out with. She's not in charge of a bunch of workers that she's telling mm -hmm. to do all this other stuff. So, yeah, they have that solitary existence. Have you seen these little bee hotels that people mm -hmm. have been making? So what do, what do you think about these? Do bees need these hotels? Do they use these hotels? Sometimes yeah. they use them. Uh, if you haven't seen these, um, you can either make them yourselves or you can buy them. And they tend to be like a lot of little tubes right. and places where bees could burrow in uh, made of wood. So a lot of our native bees, they do use hollow sticks, hollow twigs, hollow stems that come from our plants to build a nest down into. So it's good to provide that for some of them. But the problem with some of those ones you can buy in the store, it's just a block of wood that holes have been drilled into and people put it out and leave it there. And then diseases build up, parasites build up. Actually, invasive species will sometimes use them. Things like European paper wasps will take up residence on them, which in turn eat monarchs. There's a lot of problems that can be associated with them. But if you are a good steward of them, if you wash them every year, if you make sure that you replenish the sticks that are in there, drill new holes if you need to, then yes, it is a good addition to your pollinator conservation plan. So what are some other good ways that you can promote our, our native bees and other pollinators? Uh, the one that comes to mind to me would be planting plants that they like. So our native species as your ornamental uh, landscape plants. Um, you know, it's nice to have some beautiful showy non-native species. Um, and sometimes bees love them and they'll, they'll flock to them for the honey. But a lot of times those are the European honeybees. And maybe they're not as uh, good or timed as appropriately for some of our native species. So a diversity of native bees means a diversity of native plants. That phenomenon that you mentioned when the plant blooms is actually really important you want something in bloom throughout the entire season if everything blooms in the spring and then you don't support any of those summer or fall bees you're not helping everybody out you want a lot of different shapes and colors and sizes of flowers otherwise you're not going to attract the maximum number of pollinators it's also important to say that one plant is not enough I've had clients say I planted a milkweed plant and I didn't see any monarchs this summer it's a big busy landscape. You gotta put like six feet by six feet of something out there that are they're gonna be able to view from flying up above. Mm -hmm.
Maybe we'll have you on another show just on what to plant for for butterflies and bees. <laughs> oh yeah, definitely. There's a lot there, and it seems like uh, in addition to kind of the diversity of timing, diversity of kind of different forms and what they're gonna like. So not all bees are the same. We just learned that today. Mm-hmm. Some bees are gonna probably like uh, shadier areas, and some are gonna like less shady areas. Um, so you know, having that diversity of different uh, types of habitat for them might. So be. bees are noisy. Oh yeah, these are noisy. How are they making that noise? It's just the frequency of their wings as they move those muscles and buzz them. <laughs> the buzz, buzz pollination. So bees, are complicated social lives. Yes, very much so. <laughs> <laughs> Why is that? They do have a social structure in the colony, especially the honeybees and bumblebees. Mm-hmm. And so when you get down into that, there's lots of pheromones at play. And there's lots of danger. It's kind of like Game of Thrones, actually. <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's lots of things that are going on. Game of Hives. Game, Game of, of Hives. Hives. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> the uh, drones. There are lots of drones. So the drones are the male bees. They're trying to mate with the the queen, the only um, bee that's reproductive in a hive. And are there multiple queens? In a honeybee hive, you want one queen. You want one dominant queen to be in there. If her she produces a pheromone called a queen pheromone, if it starts to taper off, if she's getting older, then you'll see what we call reproductive workers pop up, where female workers are suddenly able to lay eggs, and they'll start laying male eggs, so the colony will take a nosedive because too many male bees are showing up. Male drones don't actually contribute to the hive. They just eat and mate. They don't actually do any work. <laughs> yeah, pretty good life. <laughs> yeah, well, it sounds familiar <laughs> sounds to maybe some familiar people. Sounds familiar to some people, yeah. <laughs> um, and so there's also going to be a chance where the workers will say, oh, there's not enough queen pheromone. We should make a new queen. They'll select some larvae, start to feed them some special things or withhold certain foods from them, and eventually that larva will develop into a new queen which has to emerge, attack and kill and sting the old queen and take over. If the original queen figures out what's going on, she may sting them oh while they're in the, c- the cell. The drama. Yes, exactly. Wow. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> so one thing that I feel like I, I get a lot of questions about is um, when you see a whole bunch of bees uh, kind of coding different things, it looks like they're maybe looking for a hive or looking for a new place to go, but it definitely causes some concern if the thing that they're covering is like right next to your house. Um, So what's going on there? What's going on there is that you have a bee swarm. So honeybees, when the colony gets too large or things aren't going so well, or they make some of those new queens, they may split the colony. It may bud off and go off in different directions. So a bunch of workers and a queen will emerge. They'll fly off. They'll land on a tree, on a mailbox, on a fence post, (laughs) on a car, at a gas station, and they'll hang out in that area while a couple of them go out and look for a new place to live. And they're very docile at this point. They don't do a whole lot. There's nothing to defend. So you can actually just kind of go over and scoop them into a bucket and you got a free honeybee colony. <laughs> a lot of beekeepers, they like to get phone calls about this because it's a new hive for them to get started with a very virile young queen that's going to make a lot of eggs. It looks kind of scary. But it's startling, yes. Yeah. When you see a lot of bees in any one spot, I think anybody would have that reaction of like, this is a problem. Right. Uh, they've seen the movie The Swarm, perhaps, <laughs> or what have you. So what happened to those drones that was looking for their house? That They just kind of go, well, everybody's gone. <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, there will be some that are straggled behind and they're mm-hmm. not going to be part of the new colony, but there may also still be the original queen hanging out in the hive, mm-hmm. and that colony may continue. Uh, Swarms can also just occur, though, when it's catastrophe, when the area doesn't have enough food Mm -hmm. or they've gotten sick and they need to move on. So, yeah, there's lots of reasons for them to try and get out of Dodge. So they sound like they have a lot of professions there. They know how to be house builders. They know they have their own doctors. They (laughs) know a lot of professions. Yeah, the workers do a lot in the colony. I think they start off caring for the young, correct, within the hive, and then they'll progress to being a forager. And then I think after that they can specialize even more some into being like the guards they guard the entrance to the hive and anytime somebody from a different hive comes they like can smell the difference um, of that new bee and essentially fight them and to get them to go away and there's other insects that are also specialized workers that are also specialized 
um, and go out and rob other hives. And that's another issue that the bees have to fight against. It's wild. <laughs> There's a lot of stuff wow. going on. Different social coming, orders there. Coming soon to a to cable network near <laughs> Game of Pies. Well, thank you both so much for coming and talking with us about uh, giving us some insight into this exciting world of bees. Thank you for joining us today. If you'd like more information on what you've heard on this segment of today's show, visit our website at www.fromthewoodsky.org. Hey there. If you're enjoying this podcast from WRFL Lexington, you may enjoy our live radio stream at wrfl.fm and, of course, via radio at 88.1 FM in the central Kentucky area. We have a wide variety of programs you're sure to enjoy. Just go to wrfl.fm slash schedule and see what programs appeal most to you. Thanks again for listening to this podcast from WRFL Lexington.